Welcome back everyone. Today we're going to be talking about ZAPVAP, a ventilator acquired pneumonia prevention program for the neonatal intensive care unit. So the objectives today, you're going to be able to identify some risk factors for VAP, you're going to identify how to prevent it, and you're going to demonstrate this by passing a post-test. So healthcare associated infections are infections that occur while patients are receiving medical treatment. This may be delivered in the hospital, the outpatient, the home setting, or care that you're providing to yourself under the instruction of a provider. And they're a serious complication of health care. So it is considered a medical error, and it's an expensive one. It's estimated that it costs the United States between 28.4 and 33.8 billion dollars per year. It also attributes, attributes to mortality, increased length of stay, uh, the development of bacterial resistant organisms, <coughs> and it's a very bad complication of healthcare. So the definition of app varies between sources. The most acceptable definition is it is a lung infection that develops in a patient who is intubated and receiving mechanical ventilation. Now, VAP itself accounts for 6.8 to 32.2 percent of all healthcare associated affections and it occurs in 5 to 15 percent of patients who are intubated and receiving me mechanical ventilations but these numbers are can be considered inaccurate and misleading some centers have adopted different definitions of VAP which causes their reporting numbers to be drastically different than their actual numbers so um, tracheal um, tracheitis is another uh, infection of the trachea, but it's not an infection of the lung itself. So, since it's not a lung infection, it's not ventilator-acquired pneumonia, and there you go, you saved yourself from having to report a case of VAP and, an inf and a um, yeah, medical error. But, it's very misleading, but it makes your numbers look good. It looks like the center looked better on paper. So, a lot of people are proposing that the terminology be changed and the definition be adjusted. So in the future, you're going to be hearing more of what's called ventilator associated event, which is kind of an umbrella term that's going to be benchmarking a range of clinical conditions that occur in patients that are who, who are intubated and receiving mechanical ventilation. So the complications of that, it's, um, it can extend their length of mechanical ventilation by 6 to 25 days, which is significantly going to impact your patient satisfaction. Each cost, case of VAP can cost anywhere between $10,000 and $60,000, so it's extremely expensive for the centers. So you should be doing everything you can to prevent any cases of VAP. So there are two basic types of VAP that you need to just be aware of. The first is early onset. It occurs in patients who've received mechanical ventilation for less than four days, it's usually easy to treat. You just give them their antibiotics, they clear it up, and they get extubated and all better. And there's the late onset, which occurs a little longer or a little later, greater than five days. And these are this is the bad one because it is usually antibacterial resistant, so it's difficult to treat. So knowing when the patient has VAP is important for predicting what treatment you're going to do and for reporting to, sh to show how well your center is performing. So the CDC utilizes a point system which includes that a patient be intubated for 48 hours and clinical symptom severity thing based on score based on fever, sputum changes, increased oxygen requirement, uh, radiological signs like a new in area of infiltrate on x-ray and microbiology signs like a positive sputum culture. Um, a similar scoring system is a clinical pulmonary infection score. It gives you points based on your symptoms, and it's just another one to be aware of. So in order to develop VAP, there's one thing that has to happen, is you got to be intubated with an ET tube. And just by having the ET tube in place can increase your chance of developing that VAP. For instance, an intubation that's done at the roadside by emergency services or maybe in the patient's home if they were found unresponsive could have so this intubation might have occurred after the patient already vomited and aspirated secretions so these providers had no choice but to intubate and let this person develop VAP and then treat it when it happened so the ET tube itself can bypass the body's natural defenses 
and it gives the bacteria an easy time to get, or an entry point to get into the lungs. This occurs because the ET tube inhibits the natural mucus flow, and inhibits coughing, it can lead to retained secretions, and another of the big causes of VAP is microaspirations of, sec of um, secretions. So most ET tubes have a cuff or a balloon at the bottom of it that form a seal in the trachea, and this allows for mechanical ventilation to hap happen and prevents stomach contents from getting into the lungs, but the seal isn't perfect. A little bit of oral secretions are going to pull on top of this cuff, and they're going to kind of seep in around it, past the cuff, and then get into the lungs. While it can be minimized, you can't completely prevent it. And since you can't just keep inflating these balloons, because then it's going to put a lot of pressure on the tracheal wall and you're going to cause damages to their trachea. So you can do things like suction before any time you're going to be deflating the cuff. And there are some specialty T-tubes, but we'll get into that next. So the modifiable risk factors for BAP. This is an old poll, so if this was live, you could send in your choices, but it's not, so don't bother. So specialized ET tubes. They can be effective at preventing VAP, but they are expensive. We have cast tubes, which are continuous aspiration of subglottic secre secretions that have a suction port built right into the ET tube that's right above the cuff that's going to remove these pulled secretions. They also have silver coated ET tubes that are, well, silver itself is bacterial resistant, but they are made of, they have silver coating, so they do cost a little bit more. So, if you had a difficult intubation where you're going through a lot of tubes, your price tag for this intubation would kind of skyrocket pretty quickly if you didn't get it the first try. So you can elevate the head of the bed. This is an effective means. It prevents secretions from pulling in the back of the ET tube and, in the and causing retained secretions in the lungs. <coughs> Heavy sedation? No. You need to innovate or sedate the patient enough to keep them comfortable, but you need to do daily sedate what is called sedation vacations to do a check for readiness to extubate, so that way you can decrease the duration of mechanical ventilation. So early intubation and mechanical ventilation? No. Placing the ET tube is a risk factor for VAP, but attempting alternative means like non-invasive ventilation can be, in in can be useful in preventing intubation and removes the risk of VAP altogether and routine saline lavage for suctioning? No. Lavaging the ET tube can cause bacterial bacteria that's hanging out in that ET tube to get washed down the tube and into the lungs. And there you go, you have bacteria in the lungs that you just um, introduced. But it is recommended that you use saline to clean the suction catheter after each suctioning. So there is a little truth in that, but you don't want it going down the ET tube. So these are the things you can't really control. They're out of our control. For instance, VAP rates are um, higher in patients who are living in poverty or they're homeless. Uh, often patients with poor oral health status are also at high risk because they have more bacteria in their mouth and the more bacteria there is, the easier chance there is that one of them is going to get into the lungs. And populations with poor baseline health status tend to have higher VAP rates. Patients that have had traumatic injuries are also at high rates for VAP because the injury itself might have caused them to aspirate, or our prevention measures, measures to stop that from occurring aren't medically possible. So we noticed that we could elevate the head of the bed, but if it's a patient with a head trauma, you might not be able to do that. You can clean their mouth, but let's say they had a significant oral injury and reconstructive surgery, they might not be able to you know, get in their mouth and clean it because it's just not accessible. Now here's a fancy picture that, again, you can't take the poll because it's closed. It says, where do you see or where do you see risk factors for VAP? You know, the big one I see is they don't, they're not wearing gloves, so who knows if they wash their hands. Um, the ventilator circuit, it's not heated humidity, it's not an active wire. We don't know if the head of bed's, how much the head of bed is elevated. We don't know what the oral care scheduling is. There's not a, um, suction available, it looks like, from here. Um, what else do we have? They're using an HME, which we want to try to use heated humidity and decrease the amount of condensation in the tubes. We don't know if they're sedated. Those might be IV pumps over on the side, but I'm not completely sure from this distance. Um, we don't know if it's a special ET tube. 
We don't know if he has accidental extubation precautions in place. He's not restrained, so he could wake up and just rip that tube out. And he doesn't have any DV DVT prophylactic um, processes going on. So <coughs> that bundles. The elements are fairly standard and easy. You elevate the head of the bed 30 to 40 degrees because when the patients are laying flat, there's a higher risk that they're going to aspirate or pull secretions. You got to clean their mouth regularly to destroy the harmful bacteria that's going to be hanging out in their mouth. You need to do your DVT prophylactics, which is effective in adults, but you can't really do that in neonates, so we'll get into that later. And daily, I also stress ulcer prophylactics. You want to make sure that they're not going to be vomiting anything that might be getting back down into their lungs. And you want to do readiness to extubate checks because you don't want these guys on the ventilator any longer than they need to be. So VAP bundles are effective in reducing the occurrence of VAP. A study by Azab et al. found that the VAP bundle in their NICU reduced their VAP rates from 67.8% to 36.4%. and also reduced their length of mechanical ventilation by almost 10 and a half days. I also found that there was a reduced overall length of stay and decreased mortality, but it wasn't statistically significant, but however, you gotta remember, it still can be clinically significant and significant and cause some drastic improvements in your care, even though it just didn't reach that ma magic P number. So is a VAP rate of zero possible? Man, old poll, don't bother trying it. So VAP rate of zero sounds great, but it's not possible. There are a lot of factors that come into play in this. Some centers report that they have zero cases of VAP, but it depends on the time period you're looking at. So they might say, we had zero cases of VAP you know, yesterday, so great, we're doing performing great. What You look at the month and they had, you know, they're at you know, 30, 40%, which isn't so good. They also found that VAP rates were only near zero when compliance to the bundles were over 95%. It also depends on the center's volume and health status of uh, their patients. So one center may only see a couple innovative patients a month, while another may see a dozen a day. So it's kind of expected that the busier center is going to have a higher risk of getting VAP. And there's lots of things you can do to minimize the occurrence of VAP, but no matter what you do, somebody's going to end up developing it. So you just got to do what you can to prevent it. So the VAP bundles for neonatal patients. There's a big study done by this Yoko, I'm sorry if I'm butchering it, but et al. in 2014. that evaluated the um, effectiveness of VAP prevention measures. And this is what they found. The minimal risk interventions, interventions that were proven to lower the VAP risks were, number one, to avoid intubation if you can. And you got to try your CPAP bypass non-invasives and see if you can prevent intubation altogether. If you got to intubate a patient, you're going to have to do it, but do everything you can to minimize the duration of ventilation. You got to use um, personal judgment in this category too, so you're not extubating these kids too early, so they have a high likelihood of failing within a day or two, because again, the act of intubation itself can inter introduce bacteria into the lungs. So if they need another day before their you know, higher chance of surviving an extubation, just wait another day. Don't put them through a whole another intubation just because you, know, you wanted to say you extubated them on your shift. Um, and you avoid your um, accidental extubation. So these are some strategies you can do to minimize your duration of ventilation. So you want to minimize your sedation. So you want to conserve the patient's respiratory status and muscle strength of their diaphragm. You gotta check their readiness to extubate daily to reduce your unnecessary days of mechanical ventilation. You gotta take precautions to prevent unplanned extubations and the sub subsequent reintubation that usually comes along with that. You wanna provide re oral care regularly with sterile water. So you don't wanna do any type of like chlorhexidine or anything in neonatal patients. There's actually some studies out there saying that like the oral care can be done with the mother's colostrum, and this actually will introduce bacteria into the mouth, which is the opposite of what we've been saying, but in this type of patient population, it can have some significant benefits for them to develop, to protect their gut, so that's kind of interesting. But you also minimize the ventilation circuit breaks, so you don't want to disconnect unless you have to. Try to, well, we'll get into that next, but minimize your circuit um, breaks, because anytime you open it, there's a chance that bacteria can enter. 
and you only want to change your circuit when it's visibly soil soiled or malfunctioning. I know a lot of times in the past, centers were changing it daily or weekly. It was just part of the routine of the you know the job duties that you did every day, every couple times a week. But I actually found that that was costly because it didn't need to be done, and even though they did it, it didn't really have any effective effect whatsoever. So just keep the circuit on until it's not working and you'll be in a little better shape. So these are some interventions that aren't very risky at all, but we don't know if they, there's no evidence that shows that they reduce the amount, occurrence of VAP. So you can do some positioning, lateral incumbent, reverse Trellenberg, Trendelenburg, and this closed in line suctioning which on, on the right there. It's an interesting thing with the closed suction is, yeah, we don't know that if it decreases the occurrence of VAP or not. It would be too difficult to study for, you know, ethical reasons and so on. As we don't want to, you know, cause patients to get VAP just so we can say, oh, this works better. But So there's no evidence on the closed suction catheters, but there is evidence that the closed suction catheters can be used to prevent de-recruitment of the lungs. So, and that's originally what they were developed for. So you can suction the patient without having to disconnect. So there may be some truth into using the closed suction because you don't have to disconnect to suction. And again, it, there isn't any other research that says how frequently these need to be changed or e either. So it might be the same with the vent circuits where they only need to be changed when they're visibly soiled or not working. And then you just got to make sure you're flushing the catheter e after every suction to keep bacteria from being introduced into the lungs. So the ZAP-VAP, this is a hypothetical program for a quality improvement project that can be used to reduce VAP in the NICU. So it's going to conduct, or going to be composed of three phases, prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. You can monitor your compliance to the measures monthly, and this is going to give you some quality improvement data, and you're going to enroll every intubated patient. And your goal is going to be to have 80% of your providers adhere to the measures and an overall reduction in your VAP rates. So prevention is based on evidence-based practices. You want to ev elevate the head of the bed, even like in this picture here and do your oral care with sterile water every few hours or every four hours. You can use inline suction catheters for all patients but only change when visibly soiled. You're going to provide some instructions to the staff to minimize circuit disconnects and circuit changes and you're going to include your baseline accidental extubation prevention measures that you should already be doing. Diagnosis phase we're going to use that clinical severity symptoms, so it's going to be point-based. We're going to evaluate our patient once a day for fever, hypothermia, increased white blood cells, increased secretions, or new infiltrates on a chest x-ray. If you have less than two uh, total score, you're just going to continue, continue your interventions. But if you get over two, you're likely going to be work. You're going to be enrolled in the treatment phase and get worked up for that. The treatment phase, first thing you're going to do is get your cultures of your endotracheal tube in your blood because you want to know exactly what you're dealing with. You want to get some lab work, your electrolytes, CBC, RFP, CRP, just so you can tell if there's more signs that are showing some infections. You can initiate your broad spectrum antibiotics early. And once these cultures come back, you get your sensitivity down and you find out exactly what you should be using to tailor your treatment. <coughs> so your conclusion is VAP's a common healthcare acquired infection, but it can't always be prevented. But you can minimize its occurrence. Zap fat program. This is a hypothetical program that's going to be prevent or helpful in preventing um, neonates from developing VAP. And it's going to help these NICU patients become NICU graduates and grow up to be healthy, happy, and satisfied American citizens or wherever you're at. So our post test of true false. VAP is a preventable healthcare acquired infection that only occurs when providers cut corners. This is false. You can have very low rates of VAP, but you're not going to wipe them out completely, even when everyone follows every, all the, everything they should be doing and not cutting any corners. So, true false, VAP bundles are effective tools in VAP prevention. That's true. We went over that. If you forgot, just start the video over and you'll understand why. To prevent VAP, ventilated circuits and closed suction catheters should be changed daily. You know, this is false. So you have a higher rate of VAP if you try doing this daily because you're providing the bacteria a means to enter. Uh, true or false, many cases of VAP are caused by micro aspiration of oral secretions. And this is true. We got touched that in the presentation. And hy hand hygiene is an effective element in the VAP bundle and healthcare acquired infection prevention. 
and that is absolutely true. Hand hygiene. I know I didn't touch it in the, in the um, lecture much, but we know hand hygiene is the best thing you can be doing while you're in the hospital to prevent any type of infection from reaching the patients or going between patients. That brings us to the end. Thank you for watching. If you have any comments, shoot me them below, and yeah, we'll get back with some more videos soon. Just in that type of stuff. There you go. A little bit more. Well, that's it. Thank you for watching. Don't forget, like the Facebook channel or feed. Like the or subscribe on YouTube. Let me know if there's something that you'd like me to do a video on, and let me know if you have any comments below. Again, thanks for watching.